we thank you today as we open up the book of Ezekiel once more and uh, your timing is just amazing Lord as we are moving toward the month of Elul uh, really the month of the bride and Lord we just thank you for this text and we pray that you will give us the understanding to to see what you want us to see Lord to hear what you are speaking to us today and we just give you thanks and praise we worship you we love you we bless your name Hashem Yeshua in Jesus name okay so we are in Ezekiel 16 and uh, God's love for Jerusalem is on display in this text and Jerusalem is the jewel of Israel and she's the metaphor for his chosen bride and all of the people of Israel are his but there is a smaller remnant called his bride and Jerusalem is that example. So Jerusalem is the center of worship. This is the place where God dwells. And we're gonna talk about how um, God shows us the story of two brides. One is from above and one is from the earth. Uh, Jerusalem above is the one who is faithful and free. The Apostle Paul referred to her as Sarah, our mother in heaven. And the other is enslaved in sin on the earth. She's earthy and she's uh, called Hagar. So this comparing of two women is also seen in the lives of Jacob's two wives, Leah and Rachel. These are rival wives. They are even twin sisters but very different personalities and approaches to their husband. So Leah demonstrates a bride who is unloved, yet she is seeking only to please her husband, to be fruitful, to live in peace, holding in all of her pain and her sadness and seeking the Lord's help. Rachel is the desired wife, yet she is barren. She's complaining and ultimately is found hiding uh, idols in her stuff. The Leah church is faithful to God and proves to be um, fruitful. She bears fruit that lasts and she is at peace with God. Even in her suffering, she is patient, always seeking to please him. The Rachel church is loved by the world. She is sought after, she's popular. Her beautiful edifices and state-of-the-art equipment, uh, all of these things make her so attractive, but the message is empty and shallow. She is barren of good fruit. She's always calling out to God for more, 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 but she is empty and she's hungry because she hasn't sought after his righteousness so that she would be filled. She's hiding idolatry. Ultimately, the Rachel church will die when the man child is born, and it will be the faithful Leah, the community uh, that God loves, that will live on with her uh, husband forever. So the Lord puts into parable form uh, his view of Israel from the beginning up to the end. So we're going to start at chapter 16, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. The Amorites and the Hittites were among the strongest people in the land of Canaan, and they were counted among the worst in abominable practice. So Yahweh appointed their destruction, that they should be driven from the land on account of their doings. Both tribes were directly descended from Canaan, the grandson of Noah by Ham, who had uncovered his grandfather's nakedness. Because of that evil, Noah cursed him. But God does not give them, these people, he does not give them the honor of being called the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. Instead, he says that they were Hittite and 
Ammonite. But uh, they had taken to themselves the characteristics of the children of Esau, whom God hated, a man who despised his birthright, a man that grieved his parents by taking for himself wives from the Hittites when they were told not to do so. Verse 4. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, you, nor, were you, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. So Israel was a, a baby, a newly born baby, the umbilical cord not cut, no one to care for them, no midwife to cleanse away the blood. After the washing, the body was rubbed with salt, according to a custom very widely spread in ancient times, and that not merely for the purpose of making the skin drier and firmer or of cleansing it more thoroughly, but probably from a regard to the virtue of salt as a protection from putrefaction, to express in a symbolic manner a hope and desire for the vigorous health of the child. So they had none to swaddle, none to comfort. The sons of Jacob, Israel, seemingly left to die in Egypt. As a newly born nation, having grown from a family size to a multitude as a nation, in its own blood, under the oppression of Pharaoh, hated and feared, they were oppressed and beaten. Verse 5. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed in the day that you were born. <clears throat> so like an aborted baby, I saw an article where there were 12 babies uh, that were left to die. They had survived an abortion and they were just lying in their own blood with their umbilical cord yet attached. It was a tragic image, and this is the, the image that God is painting here. So the same is for the captive and oppressed people. No one cares what happens to them, and there is none to rescue. The newborn Christian community also was hated and cut off, and uh, the people were just hoping that they would just die and go away. But God speaks over them. Verse 6. When I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. So it's interesting that this pattern is seen even in the beginning after the fall. Adam calls his wife Hava, which means living or living one. But Adonai saw them and he declared that they would live as per his covenant with Abraham. In Jeremiah 31, 35, Yahweh, who gives the sun for light by day and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, Adonai Tsevaot is his name. If these ordinances depart from me, says Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. So Yeshua spoke over the holy community as well, stating, upon this rock, the gospel of Jesus Christ, he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The gospel calls us to come and live. And so we pass from death to life. Ephesians 2.4 but God being rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our, trans through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in verse seven, the Lord goes on to describe how she grew and she thrived, she matured into a beauty, but she was still naked and bare. She had no covering. Verse eight, when I passed by you again and I looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. 
Yes, I swore an oath to you and I entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord God. So when Israel became of a marriageable age, of a time when uh, they could come and enter into a covenant with God, they had grown in number in Egypt and Adonai saw that it was time to bring them out as a bride for himself. So spreading the corner of his garment over them to cover their nakedness, covering their transgressions by giving them the covenant at Mount Sinai with all the ordinances and the sacrifices that they would be his people and he would be their God. This brings to mind the story of Ruth and Boaz, who uh, he is the type of Messiah, the kinsman redeemer. And as she lay at his feet at the threshing floor, he awakened and in verse uh, Ruth 3, 9, who are you? He asked, I am Ruth, your handmaid, she answered. Spread the corner of your garment over your handmaid, for you are a goel or a, a kinsman redeemer. So in, he, in Hebrew, the uh, spread thy wing emblem is a sign of protection. So even to the present day, when uh, a Jewish couple marry, the husband will take the corner of his talit and throw it over his bride to show a symbol that he is now going to put her under his protection. Verse nine, then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you with oil. So as a, a Jewish bride would enter the mikvah prior to her wedding, um, it's a ritual purification, a kind of sanctification, uh, setting herself apart for her new husband. So Israel was bathed and washed. Uh, they washed their clothes and they were being sanctified. They were preparing for the day that the bridegroom would descend. Believers in Yeshua are also washed, not in the waters of baptism, but by the word, by the Holy Spirit, being sanctified and set apart from Messiah Yeshua, our bridegroom, who is soon to descend to take his bride. He says, and I anointed you with oil. He had given Israel the anointed priesthood, and even now in the new covenant, every believer is anointed with the Holy Spirit, making us a royal priesthood. Verse 10, I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was a fine linen silk and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. So the kingdom of Israel prospered under the rule of King David and Solomon, and truly it was a golden age and a time of splendor, and the fame of King Solomon reached to the Queen of Sheba and beyond. And as we look at the bride of Messiah, she is clothed with fine linen. She has been given the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness, and she has been adorned with the beautiful gifts of the Holy Spirit. And though she was humble, her spiritual beauty was great. Verse 15. But you trusted in your own beauty. You played the harlot because of your fame and poured out your harlotry on everyone who was passing by. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. But you have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them, and you set my oil and my incense before them. Also my food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil and honey, which I fed you. You set it before them as a sweet incense 
And so it was, says the Lord God. So Solomon had left his kingdom littered with idolatry, and it was rent in two, the idols in the north and the idols in the south. Yeshua's bride also took on a worldly splendor, building uh, grand structures overlaid with gold and silver, and she covered her priests with purple and scarlet images, icons, and idols found their way into her, taking the beauty that Yahweh had given her and turning it into something tawdry and gaudy, forsaking the beauty of humility, reaching for the world, and turning away from God. Verse 20. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children and offered them up to them by causing them to pass through the fire? And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. Then it was so after all your wickedness. Woe, woe to you, says the Lord God that you also built for yourself a shrine and made a high place for yourself in every street. You built your high places at the head of every road and made your beauty to be abhorred. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshly neighbors, and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. So we know that Israel fell into worship, uh, the worship of Molech, and where they literally sacrificed their children in the fire. But how has the harlot church sacrificed her children in the fire? Psalm 106 says that they sacrificed their children to devils. For centuries, the harlot church obscured the gospel and taught their children to worship idols, calling them saints putting stumbling blocks in the way of salvation, offering their babes on the altar to a false Mary, giving them over to superstition and devils. Today, the harlot church is drawing in children and youth to strange fire, demonic spirits of burning that are possessing them and cutting them off from salvation. He says, and in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, why did you not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood? They did not remember their beginnings. They did not remember the purity of the gospel and the blood of Messiah. They forgot the blood of the saints, and they moved further and further from the truth. Verse 27. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you, diminished your allotment, and gave you up to the will of those who hate you. So they are given over to their worst enemies, for they played the harlot with the fiercest of nations, and they were still not satisfied. The harlot church was subdued by revolution, but only after colluding with kings and princes for power and wealth having seduced them with the intoxication of false religion. Verse 30, how degenerate, or he might say, how sick is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. I mean, that statement just really uh, impacted me. How sick is your heart, how perverse and corrupt Oh, church, how can you turn from the way? How can you forget the goodness of God? How he spared us from wrath by his own blood. How do you then look to mere men and lifeless idols? Uh, Proverbs 7.10 is, uh, well, Proverbs 7 is about the adulteress. And at verse 10, it says, Behold, there a woman met him with the attire of a prostitute, and with crafty intent, she is loud and defiant. Her feet don't stay in her house. 
Now she is in the streets, now in the squares and lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face. Verse 19, for my husband isn't at home. He has gone on a long journey. Verse 21, with persuasive words, she led him astray. With the flattering of her lips, she seduced him. She followed her, he followed her immediately as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a fool stepping into a noose. Until an arrow strikes through his liver as a bird hurries to the snare and doesn't know that it will cost his life. Don't go astray in her paths, for she has thrown down many wounded. Yes, all her slain are a mighty army. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the rooms of death. That is how God sees the harlot church. On September 20th of 2016, the Lord had given me this word, and uh, I thought I'd bring it back out again because it's still, it's still a pertinent word. He said, America is a brothel. Do you understand what a brothel is? America has rejected her creator and doesn't want my people here. Therefore, I'm going to remove my people, quote unquote, America, for I created America for my own purpose. Do not be afraid, little flock. I have not forgotten you, says the Lord. Ezekiel 16, verse 31. You erected your shrine at the head of every road and built your high place in every street. Yet you were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payment to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot. In that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite. Is the Roman church dressed as a harlot, prostituting herself to the world? She seduces the nations, pursues the leaders of governments. She says that she is, um, God says she is worse than a prostitute because a prostitute at least receives wages for her service. But this one is just insatiable. She is willing to give payments to her lovers. Could this be some kind of an arrangement, say with the UN or the New World Order? She is drunk with power and she gave herself to the lust of the nations, trading her holiness and her beauty for filthy rags of self-righteousness works that would make them bow to men and give their hearts to images, adorning men with garments decked with jewels because she is supposed to be a beautiful and splendid bride. But because of her shrines and edifices, she forsook the God of creation and looked to man, blaspheming God, the God who saved them. Isaiah 23:15. It will come to pass on the day that Tyre, or which means rock, which is a reference to Peter, will be forgotten. Seventy years, according to the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will be Tyre, like the song of the prostitute. Take a harp and go about the city, you prostitute, that you have been forgotten. Make sweet melody. Sing many songs that you may be remembered. It will happen after the end of 70 years that Yahweh will visit Tyre and she shall return to her wages and will play the prostitute with all the kingdoms of the world on the surface of the earth. And so we know that that was fulfilled on September 23rd uh, of 2015 when Pope Francis began his process of wooing the nations. He began to sing his siren song at the UN and he began to uh, come into agreement with Agenda 21 and 2030. Revelation 17, 1 says, One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. This is the Catholic Church. This is Rome. And with 
whom the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality, and those who dwell in the earth were made drunken with the wine of her sexual immorality. This is the worship of the Babylonian sun god. Uh, this is earth worship, goddess worship. This is a cult at high levels, uh, Satanism. The rulers and the leaders of the earth are drawn to this. This is all Illuminati stuff. They're all in this together. And they are making covenants with the Pope. This is the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the UN, and the World Council of Churches. God says because of her filthiness, because of her harlotry and idolatry, and the blood of the children, the martyrs, and all of the rulers and the nations you delighted in and that you hated, I, I will gather them all around against you, and I will uncover your nakedness to them, that they may see all your nakedness, and I will judge you as women who break wedlock or shed blood are judged. I will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy. I will also give you into their hand, and they shall throw down your shrines and break down your high places. They also will strip you of your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry, and leave you naked and bare. One of the greatest treasures in the entire world is in the Vatican. It is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it's not even possible for anybody to know really the value of everything that they have. Revelation 17, 4 says, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of the sexual immorality of the earth. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great the mother of the prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. And all of the non-Catholic churches uh, having become harlot daughter, all those that join with the Vatican are falling all over themselves to bow at the feet of the Pope. And they're holding up all of her ancient evil practices, which is absolute wickedness to the Lord. Uh, Revelation 17, 6. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Then I saw her and I wondered with great amazement. So the very entity that is supposed to watch over the souls of men is the very entity that seeks to corrupt them beyond recovery. And all of those that oppose her are destroyed in fire and with a sword and worse. But the one world government is already at work, as we can see national leaders are all bending to one idea. Revelation 17, verse 13. These have one mind, and they gave their power and authority to the beast. And the beast is the one that will come out of the Vatican, who will be of the spirit of Antichrist. He is blasphemous, denouncing the gospel, calling every evil good and good evil, proclaiming himself to be God or a God, because that may be the, the narrative of the um, ancient aliens, right? The gods of the ancient world. They're going to debunk uh, the biblical account. Verse 14 in Revelation. These will war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. The whole world is going to throw off the restraint of the sovereign Lord God. Lawlessness will rule, but soon they will not be able, uh, they will not need the harlot church anymore, and they're going to destroy her. They'll destroy her religion and all that worship in her. They will destroy her even as she destroyed God's people in the flame. Revelation 17 15. He said to me, The waters which you saw, where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the prostitute and will make her desolate. They will strip her naked. They will eat her flesh and will turn her utterly, will burn her utterly with fire. For God has put in their hearts to do what he has in mind to do, that they would be of one mind, to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be accomplished. The woman whom you saw is the great city, Rome, which uh, 
reigns over the kings of the earth. Verse 40, Ezekiel. They shall also bring up an assembly against you, and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through the sword. They shall burn your houses with fire and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. And I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. So I will lay to rest my fury toward you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be quiet and be angry no more. Because you did not remember the days of your youth, but agitated me with all these things. Surely I will also recompense your deeds on your own head, says the Lord God. And you shall not commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. The Lord God is not uh, going to overlook spiritual prostitution or idolatry. Yahweh hates that more than anything. In, Levit in Leviticus 19, verse 29, he commands fathers, do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. So therefore, our father in heaven is not going to tolerate it either in the house that is called by his name. Verse 44. Indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you, like mother, like daughter. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathed her husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. So speaking specifically to so-called Protestant churches, daughters of the harlot, who become corrupt in doctrine and practice, these have loathed their husband. Jeremiah chapter three, verse 20 says, surely as a treacherous wife departs from her husband, so you have dealt treacherously with me, house of Israel, says Yahweh. And again in Isaiah 54, five, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He will be called the God of the whole earth. He's saying you are not of noble descent. Again, he brings up your uh, mother was, where is it? Your mother was a Hittite and your father was an Amorite. And uh, you are not of noble descent. You don't have a noble spiritual heritage. You are as a Canaanite, an idolater. These do not fear God, and they behave as though that they were in control, that they did not need to answer to him. Verse 46. The elder sister is Samaria, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you, and your younger sister, who dwells to the south of you, is Sodom and her daughters, you did not walk in their ways, nor act according to their abominations, but as if, it, as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. So why were they worse than these pagan nations? I mean, when you consider that Sodom was destroyed with you know, brimstone, um, that's, you know, that's pretty bad. So why is the harlot church the worst thing that the world has ever seen. Because the more that you have, the more that is required of you. Did they not know the gospel? In order to come up with a false doctrine, along with a strong religious argument, in order to debate and refute people that hold the truth, you have to know the truth in order to twist it and manipulate it. A counterfeiter doesn't put his own face on a $20 bill, but they study every detail of the genuine article in, or, in order to make a counterfeit. So because they knew the truth and continued in rejection of it, even obscuring it for other people makes them the worst of the worst, for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved forever. So neither Sodom nor those who followed after her practices were as evil 
as the harlot church. Sodom was full of pride and had abundance of food, way too much leisure time. They did not help the poor. They squandered their abundance. They were haughty and committed abomination before me, says the Lord. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Samaria did not commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they and have justified your sisters by the abominations which you have done. So the foreign nations did not know God. They did disgusting things before him and they were unjust. They lacked compassion. They flaunted their acts pridefully and openly. And God says he just took them away. It was enough. He didn't want to see it anymore. And the evidence is still there, bearing witness. Second Peter reminds us that God did not spare the ancient world, but judgment came. So then why, O oh faithless church, do you not believe that judgment will come first to the house of God? Verse 52. You who judged your sisters bear your own shame also, because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. They are more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also and bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. So on any given day, you can pull up an article, a sermon or a teaching from one of the harlot churches, and they pretend to be outing false teachers or, her or heretics. But the things that they are teaching are far worse than anything uh, that they are pretending to be shocked and grieved over. It is a pretense. They're acting as though that they actually care about the true gospel. And in fact, when they display this hypocrisy, it justifies all of the discernment ministries that are they're outing them. So the sins of Jerusalem and Judah were far worse because they made Sodom look righteous. When I bring back their captives, verse 53, the captives of Sodom and her daughters and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them, that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all that you did when you confronted them. When your sister Sodom and her daughters returned to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will return to your former state. So this took me a while to figure out. I had to decipher this one. It didn't make a lot of sense to me at first. Uh, the clue here is Sodom. The Lord is saying, basically, when cows fly, then you're going to be restored. When he brings back the captives of Sodom, well, Sodom was not taken captive, but they were destroyed. There were no survivors left. So before uh, this happened before Israel even came to be. So when God brings back Sodom and the northern tribes all together, he will also bring them back. Well, that just didn't happen. So the harlot church is not going to be just, uh, restored, but it's going to be destroyed. I can't help but think about uh, that so-called prophetic word that uh, I gave to you guys as a demonstration a week or so ago, um, where that guy claimed that this is the year for the Eastern church, right? The Orthodox church to have revival. Well, God says he's not going to restore that harlot church. And they're just the same. Verse 56. For your sister Sodom was not a byword in your mouth in the days of your pride before your wickedness was uncovered. You have paid for your lewdness. This is verse 50, yeah, 58. You've paid for your lewdness and your abomination, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, who despise the oath by breaking the covenant. Why did you not remember what happened to Sodom and the things uh, for the things that they did? Were they not brought to judgment? Did they not end up just being ash? Yeshua brings this comparison forward for the new covenant that whoever does not receive you or hear your words in regards to the gospel, as you leave the house or the city, shake off the dust from your feet. Matthew 10, 15 says, most certainly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment 
than for that city. And again, speaking to Capernaum or possibly uh, any place that had witnessed the miracles of the Lord or uh, heard his words, even the apostles and the others that walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew eleven twenty three, 23, he says, you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, you will go down to Hades. For if the mighty works had been done in Sodom, which were done in you, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than you. It's, it's the idea that the more that you have, the more knowledge of God that you have, the more knowledge of the truth that you have, the more accountable that you are. Sodom, though it was wicked, uh, you know, so much so that God couldn't bear it anymore. Um, but they were ignorant of the truth. And when Yeshua returns to take his faithful bride, he warns in Luke 17, verse 28, Likewise, even as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But in the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from the sky and destroyed them all. It will be the same way in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. And so he says that when this happens, don't turn back to get your stuff. Don't take one more look at this world. He says to remember Lot's wife. And so we left off from the two brides, one the faithful remnant and the other is the brazen harlot. We have focused totally on the unfaithful harlot bride because the whole world is being gathered into her except for the remnant. Remember, Yahweh has always kept for himself a faithful remnant, even if we don't see them. The Lord is rich in mercy. He is patient, not wanting any to perish, but to repent. But as we've been reading for the past few weeks, uh, he says again and again uh, from Ezekiel 9.10, As for me, also my eye won't spare, neither will I have pity, but I will bring their way on their head. And since our God is righteous and just, he must judge treachery without pity and not sparing. And so he did. God did not spare his own son. Romans 8.32, but he delivered him up for us all. How would he not also with him freely give us all things? Who could, not, who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Yes, rather he who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So to Israel, God says uh, in verse 60, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. In Jeremiah 2.2, it says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Adonai, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride and the way you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Ezekiel 16, 61. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed. Then when you receive your older and younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters and not because of my covenant with you. So when he brings the heathen nations, the pagan idolaters to the God of Israel, and uh, joining them by the grafting in of the olive tree, then this people will consider their sins and they will repent. And when the Lord brings captivity captive and carries away the faithful bride, all Israel will repent and all Israel will be saved, not because they were faithful to the law of Moses, but by grace, having sacrificed the Son of God for us all. Jeremiah 3.12, go and proclaim these words toward the north, saying, return, black, return backsliding Israel, says Adonai. I will no longer frown on you, for I am merciful, says Adonai. 
I will not keep a grudge forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity for your sin. For you sinned against Adonai your God and scattered your favors to foreign gods under every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice. It is a declaration of Adonai. Return, O backsliding children, declares Adonai. For I am your husband. I will choose you, one from a city, two from a clan, and I will bring you to Zion. I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you knowledge and understanding. Ezekiel 16, 62. I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I prove, when I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. And so the remnant bride is the object of his desire. She is purified in the fire. She is washed in the word, clothed by the sun, and is adorned by the spirit. She has made herself ready to be his bride. She is holy and blameless in his sight. Psalm 45 says that the king desires her beauty. And since uh, he is your Lord, bow to him. The bride is called glorious in robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king and her virgin companions with joy and gladness. They are led into the palace of the king. So we are ready and we are waiting, uh, actively waiting for the coming of the king. And on Monday, we enter into the month of Elul. This is the season of Teshuva. It is said that this is the month that the king is in the field, meaning that Yahweh draws close to the earth, close to his people, even walking among them, perhaps listening for the sounds of repentance. As believers, we have assurance. We're not looking for forgiveness that brings salvation or secures our salvation, but we need to inventory our hearts to see if we have moved away from our first love in some area of our lives. So perhaps we have become complacent in our devotion. Uh, maybe we don't give him the time that we once did, or uh, we're not in the word. Perhaps we've been pushing the boundaries in some areas, maybe testing God a little bit. Let's use this time to prepare to meet him because this is the time that we need to clean our own house and, uh, you know, go through one more time and take our weaknesses to him, only to be met there with grace. The Hebrew name for the month of Elul is an acronym, and uh, it is from uh, the Song of Songs, the verse that says, I am my beloved and he is mine. This is specifically pointing to the bride of God, the bride of Messiah, who is looking for his coming to take us to himself, back to the Father's house, to the wedding of the Lamb. So this past Monday, as I was driving early in the morning to pick up my grandson, um, the Lord took my thoughts to our going home, and he began to speak this to me. I am so ready for you to come. You can't imagine the comfort you will experience on the other side of this. The tears will flow just from relief. You will be fully aware, fully conscious the whole way. And as he was speaking that, I, in my spirit, I got a, um, a little preview of what that, that relief would be, that comfort would be like. I got a little tiny taste of it, and it was overwhelming. And so um, the thought had come to me, that, you know, surely there must be a set day that was predetermined by the Father. But then immediately I thought, um, if that was the case, then why would he tell us to hasten the day? You know, if it was an unchangeable set in stone date. And the Lord reminded me that uh, with Enoch, there was a day that God just took him. It just was like, okay, I want him now. And he just took him. And so I got this sense that that is how it's going to be for us. You know, we're, we're told not to look for a particular day. We don't know the day, the hour, 
So I think it's just going to come, like he said, at a time when you don't expect. So he knows what's happening here more than we do. He knows the thoughts of every creature on the earth and every creature wherever they may be all at once. He knows their plots. He knows their plans and their schemes. They can't hide anything from him. So keep crying out to the Lord, beloved. He hears us. He hears our cries. He knows our fears. The distress that is coming on the world is overwhelming to see, but it's not our distress. We have believed and have trusted in Messiah Yeshua, the Son of God. There is no one else that can save. He is faithful who promised to keep us from the trial that is coming upon the whole earth. So let's gladly come to him with our weaknesses, our worries, our fears, even our indignation. Let's exchange it uh, for the power of his grace. For his grace is sufficient for us and his power is made perfect in weakness. I'm going to close with Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Amen.